Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Glinski, Chief Inspector with the Board of Pharmacy, and welcome to our webinar today. Our topic today is Pharmacist Immunization and Administration Update. Uh, before I get started with the presentation, I'll go through just some basic um, slides. Um, everyone is in listen-only mode. Um, if you have any trouble um, with the audio on your computer, there is a dial-in option on the toolbar you'll see there. Um, and you can dial in if you're having trouble. Um, we, we, this is proof for one hour of continuing education. Um, you must be signed up and logged in to go to webinar in order to get the CE. Um, if you're just um, watching on someone else's computer, you will not get credit for it unless you are officially signed in. At the end, I'll go over some further instructions on how to get CE. Just a reminder, our CE is not submitted to the CPE monitor, so make sure you save your certificates that we'll mail you. Handouts for this um, webinar um, are on the board's website. Um, if you go to the upcoming events tab on the left of the website, you will um, go to there and you'll see um, a link to that um, underneath the sign up information. We do record our webinars. You can watch past webinars um, on our website under publications and resources. Uh, there is no CE credit for watching um, recordings of our webinars. Uh, at the end, if we have time, we'll try to take questions from participants. If you'd like to send a question during the program, go to your toolbar, type in the question and hit send. Um, again, we'll, we'll see what we have time for at the end. So today I'm gonna to talk about some changes that have occurred to uh, the administration rules and statutes affecting immunization administration. Um, we did have a statute change this year, a bill uh, passed legislation, legislation and um, became law and had some effects on immunization. Um, the board also revised both, the, both of the rules related to administration this summer. Um, and so I'll be going over um, both of those two. And as I said, we'll try to answer questions. Um, all the revisions I talk about today are now in effect. Um, they all came into effect at different time periods over the summer and just recently this last weekend. Um, but anything I talk about today is now in effect. If you've been on any of our other programs or a comp CE conference, you heard us talking about dates when stuff would become effective and everything is now in effect. So I'm going to first talk about administrating uh, administration of vaccines by protocol. Um, the statute um, that uh, got changed was the um, 338.010. It became effective August 28th. Um, one of the major things it did, it lowered the age, minimum age for vaccines by protocol to age seven or CDC recommendation, whichever is higher. So now, previously it was age 12, now it's age seven. Um, if you have a current protocol that says 12, you will need to amend that um, in order to um, be able to go down to age seven. So you wanna make sure to see what your current protocol says. You could either do an amendment to that or you could just um, create a whole new protocol. There are no changes to the vaccines that you can be given by protocol. Um, the first four original ones, flu, pneumonia, shingles, and meningitis. And then a few years ago, um, hepatitis, the two hepatitis, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis were added. Um, and it does allow you to also do combinations of any of those. So such as Tdap as an example um, is something else you can do. So combinations of any of those um, are allowed. The statute change now requires submission to the Show Me Vax, which is the state immunization registry um, for all patients unless they opt out. So the Show Me Vax submission, as I said, it will apply to all vaccines given by pharmacist. Um, the statute is silent on the time frame you must report to Show Me Vax. The board recommends 14 days, which is similar to what the rule says and what the statute says for PCP notification. So we would recommend 14 days. The patients must be notified that they, they, this, their immunization will be submitted to Show Me Vax. The patient must also be allowed to opt out of this submission. And the patients must sign 
that they acknowledge this. So this can be done manually on a paper form. It can be done electronically. Um, the board, again, the statute's silent at this point on how long to keep these notific uh, these attestations. Uh, the board recommends keeping it for two years, similar to other vaccine records. Um, the statement that the uh, that the patient must sign could be incorporated into a patient their, your or uh, your normal patient consent form, so they're only signing one document. Um, you do want to look at your patient consent form. I have seen some that have statements about um, that uh, immunizations will be submitted to a state registry, um, but they don't may not contain an opt-out option. So um, if you're going to use a consent form, make sure it has the right um, verbiage in it, and it also gives patients an, an opt-out option. The board did create a sample um, document of what a notification to the patient would look like. It's on our board's website. Here's um, a, a copy of it. And basically the statement in the middle there could be incorporated to any into your consent form or any other document that the patient's signing. Um, as you know here, it has a opt-out um, checkbox that the patient would check if they want to opt out. So if the patient chooses to opt out, um, they still must sign a document that they're opting out. And again, the board recommends keeping that document for two years. And if the patient opts out, the pharmacy must still notify the primary care provider, the PCP, um, if the patient provided one. And this would be under the normal procedure prior to the statute change. You do it within 14 days. Um, standard notification elements of what needs to go to uh, the PCP and you must document this notification somewhere in the pharmacy record. So the Show Me Vax registry is a Department of Health database. They maintain it and do everything with it. The Board of Pharmacy is not involved with this database. Um, there's two methods that a pharmacy may submit um, immunizations to the database. The first is a data upload method and that's where a computer is dumping data into their computer. Um, it has to be an HL7 compliant system. Um, as I mentioned, the board is not involved in this, so all questions related to the database need to be sent to the Department of Health, and they have different contact information based on what method you're gonna use to um, submit data. So for data uploads, I give the contact information here is on this slide. The other method to submit is doing going on the Show Me Vax um, web page and entering um, immunizations single single entry at a time. And doing that, you they have two different options. It one's called historical, the other called inventory reporting. Um, the um, the two different method requiring different things. Um, it would be up to the pharmacist, pharmacy to decide which method they want to use. And again, if you have questions about how to get signed up, you have to get signed up for both of these. Um, either method, you have to um, get signed up with the Department of Health in order to submit. Um, but they have different contact information here um, for the Show Me Vax website method. The board's determined that if you submit to Show Me Vax, um, you then satisfy the PCP requirements uh, notification requirement in the board's regulations. And right now, one of the two methods um, of the online may not be submitting the same required information that's in the board rule. The board is waiving that and you don't have to submit those um, specific things that are missing um, if you're doing the, the show me vax thing. So if you're doing show me vax, you do not need to worry about PCP notifications um, for immunizations that are in the board's rules. You still have to do um, adverse reaction notifications to PCP though. The board will be revising their regulations. We just got them revised. We're gonna have to revise them again to accommodate the new show me vax requirement. Um, so we will plan on doing that in, in probably the near future. So in addition to the uh, legislation that passed that affected immunization, the board has, is also in the process, was in the process of revising the um, administration by protocol rule, which is uh, 6.050, 
Um, those revisions became effective over the weekend on September 30th. Um, so they're in effect now. And I'll just go through some of the changes um, in there. I would advise anyone immunizing to read the whole rule to make sure you're compliant. It's a good time to do a refresher of your procedures and your practices when we have a rule change to make sure you're still in compliance. So generally, uh, one change the board made was it eliminated the 50 mile requirement for the physician. So now the physician no longer has to be within 50 miles of the pharmacist doing the immunization. There is no mile requirement. And so now one physician could cover the whole state. So for large organizations who have pharmacies all across the state, um, they no longer need multiple pharm uh, physicians in the areas, they can use one physician um, that could cover the whole state. The physician still needs to be Missouri licensed and they need to be actively engaged in the practice of medicine um, here in Missouri to qualify. Another change was um, the uh, immunizations now can occur at any Missouri licensed pharmacy. It used to be you had to spell out in your protocol where it would take place. Now it's automatic that any Missouri licensed pharmacy, a pharmacist can immunize at those without uh, declaring that in their protocol. Um, the board included some language on proper storage of vaccines that they meet uh, manufacturer CDC guidelines. And this also includes um, outside of the pharmacy. So if you're going to holding a flu clinic at an employer, at a senior citizen center, somewhere outside the pharmacy that you use proper storage um, technique um, for your vaccines there. Some changes made to the pharmacist qualification section of the rule. Um, previously, if a pharmacist was on probation, that was automatically, they were automatically prohibited from doing any kind of immunization. That has now been removed. Um, if a pharmacist is on probation, the terms of their probation will now dictate whether they can or cannot um, administer uh, immunize. The, um, so current, for any pharmacists that are currently on probation would want to review their order and make sure it doesn't have any prohibition built into that order. If it doesn't, then the pharmacist would be allowed to immunize. There were changes to um, the certificate training program um, that's required. Um, it now lists in the rule specific criteria for these training certificate programs. Um, a big question we were asked when this uh, first came out was, do, do I have to go and get retrained? The answer is, if you're currently immunizing, you currently have an NOI with the board, you do not need to go get trained again. Um, your training suffices. Anybody new coming along will have to meet the new criteria. Um, we get asked, well, what's, what programs out there meet it? Probably the most common program we see is APHA's pharmacy-based immunization delivery program. Um, the board's determined that meets the, uh, the qualification for the new criteria. Another um, change to the rule is now any program that was put on by an accredited pharmacy school is automatically approved. So in the past, when students um, got their training during school, they would have, if it wasn't a school we were familiar with, they would have to submit for board approval. They will no longer have to do that. Um, so those programs will automatically um, be approved as long as they meet those criteria of the training um, that the new criteria listed. There's changes to the CPR requirement now. Um, going forward, um, both rules now say it needs to be healthcare provider CPR or basic life support. So you'll no longer be able to use layman's um, CPR classes for your um, CPR requirement. The rule now requires a live in-person skills assessment. So um, don't be um, applying for a totally internet-based uh, CPR program because it will not be approved. Um, and it, it will be required for your next NOI submission. So between now and your next NOI submission, if that's notification of intent submission, if um, your CPR um, expires, you want to make sure you renew it with a healthcare provider CPR or a basic life support uh, certificate. 
Um, the rule says that uh, any um, American Heart Association or American Red Cross um, CPR for healthcare is acceptable. So I pulled these off the website because we get questions a lot, well, which ones, which of the ones they offer um, count. And if you go to the website, both of them have links related to healthcare. Um, on the left, you'll see the Heart Association has a healthcare professional link. And then the Red Cross on the right has CPR for healthcare providers. So if you click that, you'll see the programs that would be approved um, for um, your CPR going forward. The new um, regulation revision um, made some changes for interns. There were no changes uh, to the actual qualifications for an intern to administer. Um, they still have to meet, they have to be cert trained in a certified program and they have to have a current CPR um, certificate and they must be directly supervised by a pharmacist who also meets the qualifications of the rule. A common question we get um, about interns is do they need to sign a protocol or do they need to submit a notice of, in of intent and the answer is no. That to both of those. Interns do not need to sign protocols or submit notifications of intent. Um, they're working under the protocol that their supervising pharmacist has. The new requirements for interns is both the pharmacist and the intern giving the um, administration will now need to keep a copy of their training and their CPR certification for two years. So this will be more on the pharmacy now. Um, if you have interns going through, you want to make sure you get a copy of their training certificate and their CPR and keep that um, in your administration records. And then um, under records in the rule that now specifically requires that if an intern provides the immunization, both the intern and the supervising pharmacist must be identified on the record. So we need the name or the initial of both the intern and the supervising pharmacist in your records. Some changes to the protocols um, requirements. Um, the rule now says these can be manually or electronically signed by the pharmacist or physicians. We've always accepted that. We put it in the rule just so everyone knows that you can do electronic signatures um, for protocols. A change is made that um, only the address of non-pharmacy locations needs to be in your protocol. So going forward, you'll no longer need to list all the pharmacy locations um, in your protocol, a lot of times we see addendums on the back of protocols listing all the pharmacies in the state uh, for some of the larger organizations or um, that. So it's no longer, you no longer need to uh, have those in your protocol. But again, if you're going off site and doing any off site clinics, your protocol needs to um, originally say that or through an amendment list those addresses. Another big change was now the protocol will dictate if the protocol physician receives the notification of the immunization. Um, in the past, it was there was no opting out of it. The protocol, regardless of what the protocol physician said, you had to, the pharmacy had to send them a notification every time they, they um, gave an immunization. Now the protocol will dictate that. So if the physician chooses not to, that you can put that in your protocol and you would not need to send visit protocol physician notifications. Uh, that's just of the immunization that does not apply to adverse reaction um, notifications to the protocol for physician. So if you wanna, if the physician wants to opt out of those, you need to make sure you check your current protocol. It may need to be amended or you may wanna issue a new protocol um, saying that, but um, your current protocol most likely should be saying that you are submitting them and so you want to re revise those. So make sure you go back and double check your current protocol if you want the physician wants to opt out. When doing an amendment and just adding new off-site locations, only the physician will be required to sign and date the amendment. In the past, whenever you did an amendment, pharmacists all had to sign those two. So now It'll be easier on you to add new locations. Only the physician will need to sign those amendments. You will not need to take it back to all your pharmacists. However, all other amendments other than adding new locations must be signed and dated by both pharmacist and physician. 
So just um, now uh, some changes to the notification requirements. As I just said, the protocol dictates whether the protocol physician gets notified. There's a new requirement that adverse events must reported best be reported to the vaccine administration um, adverse event reporting system within 30 days. Um, there's no change to adverse reaction reporting. You're still required to report within 24 hours of learning of an adverse reaction to both the protocol physician and the PCP if the patient has one. And as we talked about earlier, um, the rule requires you to notify the PCP if you're doing show me vac submission, that will satisfy the board's requirement. If you're not, if the patient's opting out of show me vax, then the, um, you would need to follow the requirement to notify the PCP within 14 days. And again, the rule now says, clearly says you must document all your notifications listed. And so somewhere in your administration record, you need to be keeping records of, of when, uh, when you send notifications or adverse reactions um, notifications. The notification of intent, this is the notice that uh, pharmac the pharmacist sent to the board telling us that you, you plan to immunize. Um, there's been some changes to this process. There's still two types of NOIs. There's one for by protocol and there's one by medical prescription order. So if you're doing it by both methods, you still have to submit two separate NOIs. Um, so that, that has not changed. Going forward, new immunizers will be submit their first time NOI online as we've done in the past years. But renewal of NOIs will now be done at the time of your pharmacist renewal. So for any of you who have an MTS certificate, it's going to be handled like that. Um, at the time of the renewal, you will get to a chance to renew your NOI. So your NOI at renewal time, once you renew it, will, will be good for two years until your next pharmacist license. I, um, I believe they all will now have a 1031 expiration date to match the pharmacist license. At the time of renewal, you, you will have to attest that you have a current healthcare provider CPR or BL, BLS uh, certificate. And you will be required to have two hours of CE. The CE must be related to administering vaccines or CDC guidelines. Um, this CE, um, it's the same time period for CE for your pharmacist renewal. So it'll be the time period to get that will be from November 1st until October 31st of the next even year. And the same CE that you use to meet this requirement will meet, will, can be used to meet your 30 hours uh, pharmacist renewal requirement. So now um, that talks about, I just talked about all the changes affecting um, administration of vaccines by protocol. I'm now gonna switch over to administration by medical prescription order. The other method the pharmacist can do that. And I'm just going to briefly tell you some people, it's unclear, I think some people don't understand that a pharmacist, other than using a protocol, can administer a drug or a vaccine based just off a prescription from a prescriber for an individual patient. So there's two methods, protocol or by prescription. The prescription one would be patient specific. So the same um, legislation that affected immunization also affected medical prescription order. It became effective August 28th. It requires show me vac submission for all vaccines given by, by RX order. So examples would be Gardasil would be one that you can't do by protocol, but you could do by prescription order. So any vaccine you're given by prescription order, the same show me vac submission would apply unless um, the patient opts out. The same documentation would require, they still have to sign something and um, you need to document all that. Um, as I said, it applies to all vaccines given by or medical prescription order and the same requirements um, as we talked about under the by protocol rule. So I'm not gonna um, go over that again. The board also revised this rule. It became effective earlier um, this summer on June 30th. 
Um, it had some of the exact same revisions that I talked about with protocol, so I'm not going to go into any detail. I'll just list them. Um, it now includes the proper storage of vaccines and drugs outside of the pharmacy. Um, the same intern documentation is required um, if an intern is giving an immunization or administering a drug or vaccine, you need to document their name and who their supervising pharmacist was and keep a copy of their credentials. Um, under pharmacist qualifications, uh, same thing, training now, program now lists um, some specific criteria. Um, same healthcare provider, CPR or BLS will apply. And again, probation is not an automatic prohibition on administering by prescription order. And the NOI for this will also be handled as the pharmacist renewal. However, the board did eliminate the CE requirement uh, for the by prescription order. So if we go back to the, uh, the CE program, the CE requirement for protocol, it's now two years every, two hours every two years uh, that's just for vaccines. There is no requirement for if you're doing it by prescription order. So uh, for vaccine, it currently, previously it was two hours per year. That now has gone down to two hours per two years. Um, and then if, if you're only administering drugs by prescription order, then you would not have any CE requirement if that was the only method you were doing. Pharmacist qualifications, um, you can now add a route not covered in your initial training program. Um, an example of that would be, um, we've been asked about uh, pre-pen, it's the penicillin allergy testing, it's given by an intradermal route. So um, most people were trained in sub-Q and IM for immunizations, um, they no longer, um, so intradermal would not have been covered there. Um, and in the past, you would have had to gone out and find an ACPE approved program in order to do that. The board has changed that. So if you want to add a route, all you need to do is be trained by a licensed healthcare practitioner who's authorized to administer. Um, so an RN, an LPN, um, a physician, anyone who is authorized to administer could train you in that route. The rule does say you need to document that, so record the dates and the routes that you were trained in, and then provide, um, document who provided the training and their credentials, uh, what kind of license did they have. You could probably just uh, print a copy of their license off the website um, they, um, and keep that in your records. And so this is a new, uh, a new change that the board was asked about so that pharmacists can expand into other routes um, since it's limited on what you can get training for um, in the initial program. The notification requirements, there's no longer notification to notify the prescriber after you've administered the drug or a vaccine. Um, you do that for vaccines, as I said earlier, the show me vax, um, is uh, a requirement, so you need to follow Show Me Vax submission requirements unless the patient opts out. If they do opt out, if they notified you they have a, P, a primary care provider, then you would need to notify them within 14 days. If you're administering non-vaccines, there is no notification requirement um, to, to anyone, PCP or the prescriber, when you're after you've administered one. There is no change to adverse reaction reporting. You still must uh, notify the prescriber if you have an adverse reaction 24 hours after learning of that. And again, you need to document um, the, um, the notifications that you do. Some other regulation changes is now um, vaccines may be given, non-vaccines, let me clarify, non-vaccines may be given outside of the manufacturer's guidelines. So um, doctor prescribes something off-label use, you can administer that, you no longer have to stay within manufacturer guidelines. Now that does not apply to vaccines. Vaccines must still be given within CDC recommendations or manufacturer's guidelines. 
giving an, a vaccine by medical prescription order is different by, than by protocol. By protocol, you have to stay within CDC guidelines. So an example is for Zostavax, CDC guidelines is age 60. You must stay within age 60 for Zostavax if you're doing it by protocol. However, if you're doing it by medical prescription order, it's either CDC recommend, recommendations or manufacturer guidelines. So in this case, if you're doing it by medical prescription order, you could go down to age 50, which is the manufacturer's guideline. So there is a difference when it comes to vaccines by medical prescription order. You have more leeway on who you can administer to. And I just realized I left off a major change that um, off this slide is the other requirement for the prescription. Uh, the prescription no longer needs to um, have the statement pharmacist to administer and in order for a ph pharmacist to administer um, a drug by prescription or vaccine by prescription order. So if you just get a, a prescription and um, it lists um, what normally would be on a prescription and tells the route, you would be then um, have enough, you have the authority now to give it. You do not need to call and get authorization from the prescriber th that you can administer that drug or vaccine. So that is a big change going forward. And sorry, I left that off of this slide. So now that I've talked about both um, types of administration that, and that can be done by protocol or by prescription order, I'm now gonna talk about some of the compliance issues and some of the guidance we have out there um, that we see. Uh, these are just some of the things we see on inspection. They're in no specific order here. Then I kind of broke them into topics. The first one is issues with protocols. Um, on inspection, we still find pharmacists who have not signed or dated the protocol. Um, we have some come across some who have, do not have a protocol, um, or maybe have, uh, another example would be of them not dating their protocol. They signed it, but failed to date it. We've had pharmacists immunizing on expired protocols. So they failed to catch that their, uh, their immunization protocol expired and they didn't uh, get a new one. We've come across protocols that are valid for more than a year. The rule says a, a protocol can only be good for one year and then you have to get it renewed. Uh, we see people failing to amend their protocol when they're needed. When it's needed, probably a couple of common ones is you want to go off site. You've already signed your protocol. Somebody calls you and say, hey, could you come do an off site flu clinic? And you fail to go back and get an amendment to your protocol to add that new location. Um, with the Shingrix, we had pharmacists failing to amend their protocol to include Shingrix. Uh, Shingrix and Zosavax are two different types of vaccine, one being live. And so protocols may need to be amended in order to accommodate the new Shingrix by, uh, vaccine. So um, those are some of the examples of uh, pharmacists failing to amend their protocol when needed. Sometimes we have pharmacists just not following the protocol for various things that we might witness during uh, while we're in inspection or in the records or failure to notify someone of an adverse reaction. Another thing our call out is some of the national uh, organizations sometimes use a national protocol um, that really hasn't been fully tailored for Missouri and it may list other vaccines on there that can't be um, done here in Missouri. So um, you want to make sure you read your protocol, make sure um, you understand it. We've also had issue with pharmacists who work across state lines um, in St. Louis area working in Illinois or in the Kansas City area who also work in Kansas that have different requirements and maybe different vaccines that can be administered and they lose track of what location they're in and um, give a vaccine that's not actually allowed in Missouri. We've seen that happen. Um, amendments not signed and dated by all parties. Um, that we, that's a common thing we're not seeing. The physician may sign it, but not all the pharmacists signed. Going forward, as I said, if you're just adding a loca new offsite location, pharmacists won't need to sign those. Um, unable to produce previous protocols, sometimes you run into that. Um, the rules do require you keep eight, a protocol for eight years. Uh, that's actually a Board of Healing Arts 
requirement that got entered into our rule. So um, eight years is you make sure you're keeping those, but sometimes we want to see the last year's protocol and people can't find that. So uh, you want to make sure you're able to uh, save and produce those on inspection. Issues with the notification of intent. Um, sometimes we have pharmacists, especially new pharmacists, new graduates, or someone who has reciprocated in from another state, not realizing they needed to submit an NOI. We have those who fail to submit separate NOIs. As I said, if you're doing it by protocol and you're doing it by medical prescription order, there's two separate NOIs that have to be submitted. Sometimes people do one and not the other, thinking uh, they didn't realize they needed to do both of them. We have people um, whose NOIs expired and continue to um, immunize or administer without renewing one. Hopefully going forward with our new system, a lot of this hopefully will get cleaned up, um, especially with the expired ones. They will all expire going forward with your uh, license renewal. Uh, for those that don't know, you know, the board does audit, do a random audit of people who have submitted an NOI and they audit and ask, hey, can you produce the CPR or the certificate program that you said you had when you submitted your NOI? Uh, the board will do an audit. They send a letter out asking you to produce those. Um, sometimes pharmacy misplaces things, pharmacists misplace things, can't produce them. A common issue is with CPR. At the time you did your NOI, you had a, a, a CPR, and by the time we do an audit, it may that CPR may have expired and you have um, renewed it, but you discarded your previous CPR certificate. So make sure you save your CPR certificates. Um, so if you are audited, you would be able to produce those. Records, um, incomplete administration records or inaccurate. Um, sometimes pharmacists don't have all the required fields on their administration records that are required by the rule, especially when they have different forms for different vaccines. So example would be their vaccine administration record for flu has everything, but they also have a uh, a separate different form they use for Shingrix. And, Whoever created that did not go back and verify that everything on in the rule is on there. So um, if you're using different types, different forms for the different types of vac, make sure they're all compliant with the rule. We do find times where pharmacists are not completing and filling out the complete record. Um, failure to document if no primary care provider, uh, provider is given, that's now included in the rule. It says that you need to document that if they say they don't have one. Don't just leave the fill blank, put an NA in there. If it's blank, we make the assumption you did not ask them if they had one. Failure to document notifications um, is, is required, especially we, we've had people filling to document adverse reaction notifications, said they had one contacted the physician, but they didn't keep any records of it. Um, we have issues with people uh, not being able to find their policies and procedures. Um, medical prescription order requires you have written policies and procedures, and uh, they're unable to produce those during an inspection. There's also sometimes misunderstanding between what a protocol is and what the RX um, order policies and procedure is. They're two separate documents, even though they may say some of the very same things in them, um, you need, they're two separate documents. You cannot hand us your protocol and say that's also my policy and procedure for anything I give by medical prescription order. And again, a lot of the sections in there may be similar, but you need to create your own separate document. Another thing with protocols is sometimes we find in protocols where it says C addendum or um, in there in our appendix or something, and we go and the appendix is not attached, it's no longer in there. Examples of it says follow um, this policy and procedure on handling adverse reactions. The protocol just says refer to this document, but we cannot find that document anywhere. So make sure if you are, your protocol does reference other documents that you have a copy of that attached to your protocol. And also make sure that you've given that to your protocol physician too. 
Some other things we come across is failure to notify all, all the required people for an adverse reaction. Sometimes we've had people not do anything when an adverse reaction was reported to them. Uh, you're required to document it, notify, depending on how you did it, the protocol physician in the PCP or, maybe, or just the prescriber if it was done by prescription order. Uh, but you need to document that. You should keep record of what, what the adverse reaction was and what, um, if any, treatment you provided there or if you referred them on to someone else. Um, pick the pharmacist in charge not overseeing compliance. Um, pharmacists are in charge, are required, they're responsible for these administration programs being done at the pharmacy. So um, when a staff pharmacist fails to sign the, the protocol or fails um, to do something, the, phar the pharmacist in charge is also responsible for not making sure everything's done there. So if you're a pharmacist in charge, make sure you're reviewing your program at, and it meets all our requirements and make sure that everyone's properly trained and know what they need to be doing uh, because it is your responsibility to oversee that program. Another one I didn't include here was that we have seen some storage issues with um, vaccines. Notably, we found Zosavax in the refrigerator before. Um, so if you are handling Zosavax, you might want to re-educate your staff and remind them that that's a freezer item um, and not put it in the refrigerator. Some compliance guidance we have out there. Um, the August uh, 18th newsletter, which is on our website, um, went into detail over the statute change revisions, uh, not just did immunization, but it also did all the statute revisions. But if you need more information on statute revision, that's a good source to go to. Back in June, we issued a notification of rule changes document, and it covered the changes that I talked about in prescription order here. Um, I expect we will be producing one of those uh, rule changes guides for the protocol rules that just became effective this weekend. So watch for email alerts um, for that. Um, and if you're aware, we do have a checklist brochure on our website that covers both of the types of administration a pharmacist can do. And we're in the process of updating that with all the new um, things I talked about here. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have an updated version of that out on our, our website. Again, we'll probably announce that through an email alert when we get it out there. Okay, so we now have some time for some questions. Um, if you'd like to submit a question, go to your toolbar and type it in and hit uh, send and we'll see what we can do. So give me a second here to switch over to questions. We have some questions about Show Me Vax. Someone's asking, what does Show Me Vax do with the data? Um, I'm not the person to probably answer that question. I do know it's stored in a database that practitioners can access. So they do store it there for practitioners who sign up. So if you want to see someone's past history, you can log on and get access to it. I do not know what else the Department of Health does with that data. That would be a question for the Department of Health. Uh, someone's asking about the wording for the show me vax opting out. Uh, they want to know, does it, can it be them giving permission or does it have to specifically say they're opting out with a checkbox? The guide that we put out is just a recommendation. You can do whatever, you know, form you do. I would suggest anyone you run it by your legal counsel if you have questions on whether it meets the statute requirement. Um, but the, the note that wording needs to tell them that it's going to be given unless they opt out. And I don't, I guess it'd be up to you on how they do that, but they have to sign the document or whatever, either way. So just make sure that's covered there. Again, the boards, if you want standard language, you could use the boards. Um, sample we have on our website that I had on the program here. Right. 
see if we have any other show me vax questions. Someone's asking, to, I think they're asking if we enter the information in the show me vax, do we still need to keep a paper record of the vaccine? That would be your vaccine administration record. And the answer is yes, um, you do need to do that. Um, the, um, um, the board's requirement is that you still have a document. So recording lot and expiration date in Show Me Vax does not satisfy the board's requirement to record it in your vaccine administration record. Someone's asking is if we're reporting to show me Vax, is it still necessary to record the MD address? I assume that means PCP address um, on your administration record. Is the answer is yes, because that show me Vax submission satisfies the notification requirement. It does not satisfy the board's records requirement for what you need to have on your administration record. Okay, let's switch to some of the other questions. It looks like most of them for show me backs now. Um, Someone's asking about the live in person requirement for CPR training, and they said. Um, they use a mannequin, mannequin, but they do not have an instructor. There has to be someone live in person assessing your skills. So I'm not sure how that's being done without an instructor or someone there who's doing it, but there has to be a, someone there in person assessing your skills on the mannequin. Someone asked about the pharmacist to administer statement. I think they submitted this prior to me getting that, that 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 has been done away with. You no longer are required to to have that on the prescription when you're doing it by medical prescription order. I'm not quite sure I understand that someone has a nursing student as a technician who's trained on vaccine administration. Are they allowed to administer? The answer is no. Um, a technicians cannot administer regardless of their qualifications. Would you need to treat them as an intern? Yes, they would have to be registered with the board as a, an intern pharmacist uh, in order to administer under our rule. Someone wanted clarification on the CE requirement for protocol. It's two hours per renewal period. That has changed. It used to be two hours per calendar year. So now it will be two hours per renewal period. Your renewal period is a two year period. So actually the requirement has gone down, but um, it's two hours per renewal period. Someone wants to know, can a pharmacist give rabies vaccine? They could if they had a prescription for it from a prescriber. Um, it would be, you know, you'd have to follow the Rx by pres um, medical prescription order rule, but um, it, that rule does not limit you on what vaccines you can give by prescription order.
Someone wants to know why fire stations are allowed to do drive-through flu shots. Um, and pharmacists are required to keep all this records. Um, we don't regulate fire stations, so I can't answer that part. Um, the board um, believes that the, the paperwork is, re is, a, is required for patient safety, that you keep those records. That's why we require you to have records. Someone wants to know about if you're asked to look at a vaccine reaction that was not given, the vaccine was not given at your pharmacy. So I guess they got a shot at their physician's office. They say an example is on a weekend, they come into your pharmacy and they want you to look at their adverse reaction. Um, they want to know, well, your um, that would not be your adverse reaction. So you're not required to do um, anything according to the rules since you weren't the one that administered that. Um, so I don't know. I think that might be a question for your legal counsel. You want to know what your obligations are if that happened. Um, I think you should ask your legal counsel on on that. Um, but the, the board ruled when it applied to, to you since you did not uh, give that um, administration. We're getting a lot of questions unrelated to today's topic, so I'm going to skip over those. Again, another person asking to clarify the CE requirement. It's now two hours per renewal period, so that's every two years. Someone who said they haven't practiced in Missouri, they don't live or practice in Missouri, but still has a Missouri license. If they decide to come back, would they have to take a new training program? It would all depend on what training you had at the time you were trained. Um, I, I don't know the time frame you're talking here. Um, most pharmacists who went out and got training on their own probably got the APHA program. So what you would want to do is look at your certificate and see if it was an APHA, if it was the APH program. If it was, then yes, you, I mean, you would not need to be retrained. If it was something else, um, um, you, we would just have, you'd need to get some information about it. Or if it was provided by a school, then it probably would, would be okay. Uh, someone's asking about show me backs not requiring the certain requirements that to report that our rule does. Um, the board does plan to revise the rule, um, but current they have to said that if you're reporting to show me backs, even though you may not be reporting all the data that's required by our rule, you you suffice the PCP reporting requirement. So regardless of the data. You're submitting to show me vax if you're not doing, I think he's listing the cider root is not what he listed. Um, you do not, you, you're okay, you're meeting the board's rule when you use show me vax. Someone's asking, can you use an electronic signature to opt out of show me vax? The answer is yes, you can do manual or paper, you just need to document and, and be able to produce that. 
Someone wants to know how long it takes for an immunization to show up in show me vax. I do not know. That would be a good question for the Department of Health. So if you need to know, uh, you might contact um, the um, one of the two contact informations I gave you back on that slide where I talked about that. Someone said, <laughs> FYI, they, they looked themselves up in Show Me Vax and it had all their information going back before elementary school. So, someone wants to know can a relief pharmacist give immunizations? Yes, any pharmacist can as long as they meet the requirements of the statutes and the rules. Um, they just need to make sure they do it. It doesn't, employment status does not affect the boards, your ability to immunize with the board. Someone asked for a spreadsheet of all the differences between um, vaccines by protocol, or no, vaccines and non-vaccines. Um, we're working on the updated checklist that will kind of do some of that. I'm not sure if it goes into, it's not specific on non-vaccines versus vaccines all the way through though. Someone wants to know, how do these rural changes affect hospital pharmacists? Well, the boards, if you're talking about um, inpatient practice, immunizations and vaccines given within the Department of Health licensed premises, these rules do not affect that. Those are being, those would be governed by the Department of Health rules. Um, I will tell you in the past, I mean, the Department of Health doesn't have a lot about that. And, the, the um, addition of additional routes to, to be able to do additional routes um, was actually a hospital um, issue of hospital pharmacists wanting to be able to um, administer drugs on um, codes and other instances. Um, but this rule doesn't really affect that because if you're administering a drug on a code that would not be under the board's jurisdiction, it would be under the Department of Health. So you would really need to ask the Department of Health um, how, um, what requirements they have in order for a pharmacist to be immunizing or administering drugs um, within the licensed hospital premises. Well, with, we're about out of time, so I'm gonna have to stop the questions there. Um, Going forward, I don't have any webinars scheduled at this time, so watch for email alerts announcing when we'll have the next one. Um, we do have recordings of the ones we've done so far this year. We had a technician compliance uh, webinar that was intended for um, technicians. Mike Boger gave a BNDD update. We have a recording of that. And then in August, we gave a legislative update of all the legislative changes. Um, those three are, are on the board's website. Two weeks ago, we did a sterile compounding update. When I looked yesterday, it was not on our website yet, so it should be there shortly. Just uh, one last time, anyone who missed one of our regional uh, patient safety and compliance conferences, we're holding our last one in Columbia. We were in St. Louis, Springfield, and Kansas City. And so the last one's gonna be held in, in October 23rd. It's a Tuesday. It's gonna be at the Hampton Inn and Suites in Columbia. It is a free program. The program runs from 12.30 to 4.30. We do provide a free lunch that starts at noon. You'll get three and a half hours of CE. We have speakers from Center for Patient Safety, BNDD, and board inspectors who will be presenting. Um, you can sign up for this on the board's website on the left side under upcoming events. Continuing education for today's webinar. Um, do not close your browser at the end of the webinar. Um, once I announce I'm closing the webinar shortly, a little window will open up that says I've ended the webinar and that it will exit. On that, you need to click close. Once you click close, do not close your browser yet. Uh, survey will then pop up on the, your screen and answer those quick questions and click submit. 
For some reason, if your survey does not op open up, you can email us at compliance at pr.mo.gov and we'll send you the questions. Uh, you must have those returned in within 24 hours if you want to receive CE. Um, we will be mailing certificates out. I usually say within approximately 30 days. Um, since it's renewal time, maybe we can get them out sooner, hopefully. Um, we, and I said we will have a recording of this webinar on our website. We usually send out an email alert when it's available. So I'm now am going to close the webinar. Thank you for, and I hope you found it helpful today.